to the Explorists. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. I'm hard at work producing season three right now, which is just a few weeks away. In the meantime, though, I give you a special bonus episode to celebrate the Explorers' third birthday. Thank you for listening and supporting the show these past three years. It's been a blast. Today's topic links the ancient past with the time and place we'll be traveling to next. It's an issue we tackle in every era, and one the Explorers just loves bringing into the light. That's right, we're talking about menstruation. People of the past often feel like a different species, but when you remember that Cleopatra too had to figure out what to do when caught out without period supplies, or that Elizabeth I might have had to deal with bad cramps during meetings, it gives us insight into their lives and provides a visceral link to the women of yore. So let's dive into the history of the period, the beliefs it's inspired, the sometimes wild notions that have built up around it, and how people have dealt with it through the millennia. But first, a disclaimer. This podcast focuses on the lives and times of women in history. What defines womanhood? Now, that's a complicated question. This episode is about women who menstruate, or have done so at some point. But I don't mean to suggest that only women menstruate, or that all women do. No one should be defined by their anatomy, and identity isn't dictated by the body we have and what it does. When I talk about women who menstruate, I'm also talking about people who menstruate. With over 800 million people doing it daily, and roughly half the world menstruating at some point in their lifetimes, this topic is one we could all stand to explore. So grab some bog moss and some menstrual suspenders. Let's go traveling. Let's start with a quick period primer, just so we're all on the same page. What is menstruation exactly? Menstruation, aka having your period, is when a person's uterus sheds the lining it's built up during the course of the menstrual cycle, the lining that's designed to cushion a fertilized egg. It exits via the vagina over the course of what's usually a couple of days. A woman will have, on average, 500 periods in her lifetime. That's roughly 2,500 days, or, if my math is correct, 6.8 years. Woo! That is a mighty frequent companion. Throughout time, and pretty much the world over, we see cultural taboos about menstruation. Customs and beliefs that make it ritually unclean, spiritually potent, and even dangerous. Lots of cultures have believed it has the power to pollute their surroundings and, specifically, to endanger men. Ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle believed that if a woman with her period looked into a mirror, it would cloud over, such was her force. Menstruation not only affected her eyes, which after all were full of blood vessels, but also had the power to disturb and distort the air around her, forming a sort of angry female cloud. Ancient Romans also feared the mystical power of menstruation. Pliny the Elder, bless him, wrote that if a woman got her period during a solar or lunar eclipse, she could kill a man just by having sex with him. This is an idea we'll see crop up throughout the ages, that period blood has the power to damage a male member. But it could also be a force for good. Eh, kind of. If a menstruating woman hiked up her skirts and walked through a field, she had the power to kill crickets, locusts, you name it. Apparently, this phenomenon was first discovered in Cappadocia during a particularly bad beetle infestation. A bunch of menstruating women walked through the fields with their skirts hiked up to their butt cheeks and those beetles fell dead, right off the corn. This isn't so much about period blood being a boon, per se, but about it being so potent that it has the power to kill plagues. Sort of a backhanded compliment. But wait, there's more! Pliny has tons to say about menstruation. There is no limit to the marvelous powers attributed to females. For in the first place, 
Hailstorms, they say, whirlwinds and lightning even, will be scared away by a woman uncovering her body while her monthly courses are upon her. The same, too, with all other kinds of tempestuous weather, and out at sea, a storm may be lulled by a woman uncovering her body merely, even though not menstruating at the time. Who knew a striptease had the power to soothe the ocean? Next time you're caught in a storm at sea, you know what to do. Pliny also tells us that it's a well-known fact that the touch of a menstruating woman does a lot of damage. It can make bees forsake their hive, turn boiling linen black, blunt razors, and contaminate anything purple. Alrighty? Throughout history, we'll see the idea pop up that menstrual blood itself is potent, even magical, but its properties are almost always sinister. In ancient Egypt, menstrual blood was considered a source of both good and evil. While an inscription at the Hathor Temple says that one god listed among his chief dislikes a menstruating woman, rude, menstrual blood was also considered medicine. It was added to all sorts of drugs, ointments, and salves. One papyrus scroll suggests that if a woman had droopy breasts, for example, smearing some menstrual blood on them would perk things right back up. Even our friend Pliny had to admit that. Baneful as it is. Period blood had potentially useful applications, especially when it came to breaking spells. Another thing universally acknowledged, and one which I am ready to believe with the greatest pleasure, is the fact that if the doorposts are only touched with the menstruous fluid, all spells of the magicians will be neutralized. It makes sense that period blood is often linked to magic. In times when we understood little about how our bodies worked, the whole thing seems pretty magical indeed. It's unique from other forms of blood. It doesn't clot like a wound, and it can't be stanched. It arrives and departs on a regular schedule and is typically associated with a particular sex. The period has also long been linked to the moon. Etymologically speaking, the word menstruation comes from the Latin word menstruare, or menstrus, meaning monthly, which stems from mensis, or moon. It's been associated with the moon in several religions. Makes sense, given it works on a monthly cycle. And moon deities are almost always depicted as female. In Mayan mythology, menstruation's origin story comes from the moon goddess, whose monthly flow was given to her as a punishment for sleeping with the sun god when she'd been told not to. How dare you? Her blood was stored in 13 jars, where it transformed into snakes, insects, poison, and myriad diseases. Many cultures around the world have seen menstruation as making a person more powerful. In North America, the Cherokee people traditionally believed that menstrual blood gave women special powers that let them destroy their enemies. Her blood makes her potent. It gives her spiritual powers. But that also means she might become a danger to the world at large. It's no surprise, then, that in many cultures, those who menstruate have been kept isolated from the community during their monthlies, sent off to huts to wait it out. This has been painted as something akin to period jail, but anthropological studies suggest this isolation isn't always punishing. These huts have also served as spaces for rest and reflection, crafts and bonding, and a break from domestic demands. In some communities in the Hindu Kush, there's a Bashali, a large menstrual house, which serves as a kind of all-female clubhouse. It is a secret and venerated space. It's even considered holy. Some cultures haven't made the period either good or bad, but acknowledged its potent power. Amongst the West African Beng, menstruating women aren't supposed to go into crops, but not because it might hurt the harvest. Mixing biological fertility with vegetable growth might actually mess with her childbearing. In the non-Western world, there are plenty of rituals surrounding a woman's first bleed that acknowledge and respect it. Traditionally, amongst the Asante in Africa, girls getting their first period are celebrated, seated beneath a queenly umbrella and given gifts. The euphemism often used to tell an Asante queen mother that a girl in her community has gotten her first period is a phrase that translates to, she has been made perfect. The Ojibwe people of North America have a ritual for a girl's first cycle. 
She fasts from eating strawberries for a full year, marking her transition from childhood to adulthood. It's a time to learn wisdom from older women in the community and to connect to one's ancestors, a link to the future and the past. And yet we continue to find a connection between menstrual blood and a dark kind of magic. In England, during Tudor times, there are those who thought that a woman's menstrual blood was dangerous, even poisonous, and could seriously harm a man's tackle. A child born from having sex during menstruation would end up <gasps> a redhead and potentially deformed. Menstrual blood has been coveted for use in charms and potions of all kinds, most particularly love potions. In France, during the Sun King, Louis XIV's time, it was added to perfumes to attract a potential lover's attention. One of Louis's chief mistresses sprinkled such concoctions on his meals to keep him keen. I did a bonus episode on this very thing if you're interested. The belief that menstrual blood might inspire fond feelings continues in some quarters. Try googling magical uses for period blood and you'll see what I mean. In 2009, an Indonesian maid appeared in a Hong Kong court accused of adding some to her boss's food, hoping to make their relationship more profitable. It seems it didn't work out the way she hoped. Part of the confusion in past eras about the period evolved from how little we understood the workings of our bodies. In 1540, English physician Thomas Reynold argued that surely period blood couldn't be evil, as menstruation was clearly an ingredient in fertility. But very few women were writing down anything about periods until very recently. Hildegard von Bingen, a medieval nun and visionary, wrote about how she thought menstrual blood could cure things like leprosy. But she was the exception, not the rule. And the less we talked about it, the more it became a mysterious secret, which only added to its mystical power and the anxieties surrounding it. Besides the blood itself, the act of menstruating has been considered important for health. Greek physician Hippocrates tells us that because women are softer and more sponge-like than men, they run the risk of filling up with fluids. If not expelled, she could drown in her feminine essence, or be driven crazy by it. This is especially true of virgins. He says they often have bad dreams and visions during their first menstrual episode. Yes, the women on the rag be acting crazy stigma goes all the way back. But don't worry, he has suggestions for how to stimulate a lost menstrual cycle. It involves cow dung, beef bile, and myrrh. Ah, Hippocrates. He also has opinions about what the length of a woman's period portends. If it's longer than four days, then her eggs are probably delicate, not good. But if it's less than three days, women tend to take on a masculine appearance and are unlikely to conceive at all. That's a pretty small window of feminine healthfulness. And in an age when your ability to rear healthy babies was paramount, the length and characteristics of your flow were things you weren't likely to want to advertise. And yet these are things that sometimes bleed out into the public sphere, whether we like it or not, especially if you are a public figure. Catherine of Aragon, English King Henry VIII's first wife, famously suffered from irregular periods, and a lot of people knew about it. France's queen, Marie Antoinette, kept her mother back in Vienna well informed about how her downstairs area was flowing. Two centuries earlier, Catherine de Medici employed a wide range of people to document her daughter's cycle. Ugh, mom! One of the reasons the period has historically been watched closely is because of its role in signaling the shift from childhood to adulthood, in some eyes, marking a person as ripe for marriage. England's Margaret Beaufort got married and gave birth to future King Henry VII at the age of just 13. Oh my. Let's follow this swiftly darkening rabbit hole a little further to another troubling blood-related tracking device, the traditional practice of checking the sheets after a couple's first night together to see if the woman has bled, ensuring she went to bed a virgin. The blood in this instance comes from the hymen, a thin tissue surrounding the vaginal opening. The notion is that when someone is penetrated for the first time, the hymen breaks, which causes bleeding. 
But here's the thing about that. The hymen stretches, and it doesn't ordinarily cover the entire opening, so really, there's no need to break the thing in order to have penetrative sex. For that and a number of other reasons, hanging our hats on bloodstained sheets for signs of our virginity, which is really just a social construct anyway, are seriously troubled waters for women of the past. And they still are now. Virginity tests have been around forever, and they're still happening. These tests, which the UN has called a human rights violation, have been recently documented in at least 20 countries. The results can determine whether someone can marry or get a job, and even test if she's a rape victim. Not only is this a violating and traumatizing test, but the results aren't in any way reliable. And yet, those results have serious consequences. In Afghanistan, for instance, where sex before marriage is considered a moral crime, hundreds of girls have been subjected to these tests and jailed for failing them. Misinformation has long been a part of the problem. Period blood isn't a body's way of flushing out toxins, turns out. Nothing about it is damaging. It's not even blood, per se, but a mixture of blood, mucus, bacteria, and uterine tissue. Not a magical, tainting substance that will kill bugs and destroy all it touches. And yet, feelings of shame and perceptions of uncleanliness are still holding pretty strong. This, in turn, often makes us want to hide it. In 2010, a study in Sweden showed that only 38% of women suffering from excessive menstrual bleeding told their doctors about it. In 2018, an article in medical journal The Lancet in the UK suggested that nearly 80% of adolescents who menstruated had experienced worrying menstrual symptoms, but didn't go to see their doctor about it. 27% of them said it was because they were too embarrassed to do so. It doesn't help that, even in our language, we're reluctant to talk about the period explicitly. We tend to use euphemisms. A study conducted in 2016 asked people in 190 countries what terms they used to talk about menstruation, which revealed some 5,000 slang terms. Some of the most common around the world are aunt flow, that time of the month, that thing, being on the rag, the red tide, lady time, and strawberry week. The Danes get lyrical with painters in the stairway, and experimental with there are communists in the gazebo. Even in advertisements for period products, we've struggled to call a spade a spade. Historically, even pad and tampon companies didn't want to talk about it in frank terms. Instead, they offered big, blown-up slogans like free from embarrassment and hygienic freedom. In one Kotex pamphlet called As One Girl to Another from 1940 suggests their pads would never make telltale outlines and never give your secret away. In America, advertising menstrual products on TV was banned until 1972. And it wasn't until 1985 that someone actually said the word period in a national pad commercial. That someone was a young Courtney Cox. Get it, girl? Because it's been framed as some kind of shameful secret and linked with uncleanliness, a lot of people who menstruate try to hide the evidence and are reluctant to talk about it. Many don't really understand it. Figures from the Eve Appeal from 2019 suggest that one in four young menstruators didn't know what a period was until they had one themselves. That ignorance also extends to those who don't menstruate. Here's a telling anecdote. Before Sally Ride became the first American woman to go to space in 1983, NASA engineers asked her a lot of anxious questions. Would 100 tampons be enough for a week-long journey? Spoken like men who had never had a frank conversation with their menstruating loved ones. Studies show that most boys, in America at least, first learn about periods from family members, usually sisters. But a lot of the boys surveyed said no family member ever spoke to them about such things. And not all sex education is created equal. Let's move on from menstruation itself and look at the things we've used to actually deal with it in the moment. 
To begin, we should acknowledge that people of the past probably had fewer periods than we do. Blame it on poor nutrition, shorter lifespans, and the tendency to have children early and often. And when they did, they didn't have the option of running to the store for a box of tampons. So what, historically, have we used to stanch the flow? We don't have a lot of evidence from the long-ago past in terms of what period supplies were used, for many reasons. But it makes sense that those who menstruated were reaching for whatever they had to hand. Mostly, that meant some kind of homemade pad. Ancient Egyptians seem to have had some kind of loincloth situation. We know this because, in a papyrus scroll that describes a list of unpleasant professions, we learn how much it sucks to be a laundryman. Specifically, because he had to handle women's stained underthings. In medieval European times, there was a common type of super-absorbent bog moss. Some think it got its most popular nickname, blood moss, because of its use on the battlefield. But others think it earned its name because of how often it was used to soak up other kinds of blood. But the easiest and most likely solution for pretty much all of history was some form of rag, usually made out of linen. There's a reason that one of our most popular euphemisms for having one's period is being on the rag. These were fairly easy to come by, and then to wash and reuse. Then again, for most of history, women weren't wearing what we consider underwear. So how were they keeping these rags in place? Again, it's murky, as most women were making these supplies themselves at home. But ads that started cropping up in the Victorian era of mail order offer clues to how some might have worked. Most of the commercial sanitary products on offer involved belts that you could attach a reusable cloth to. So basically, we're still working with the Egyptian loincloth situation. These were still in fairly prevalent use in my grandmother's time. If a belt wasn't your style, these ads suggest you try a pair of suspenders, which kept your menstrual bandage where it was meant to be. As you'd imagine, these things could be bulky and pretty uncomfortable. The commercial pad doesn't seem to have really hit its stride until World War I, which spurred a lot of innovation in the realm of bandage technology. The Snafnikins took a page from medieval period history by using sphagnum moss. Grown in the Pacific Northwest, this Portland company processed the moss and wrapped it in a gauze covering. Its packaging even featured a Red Cross sphagnum moss girl, nodding to its connection to wartime field dressing. Kotex napkins, introduced in 1921, were also developed with battlefield technology. They used cellucotton, a wood pulp product enclosed in gauze. Strong marketing meant strong sales, and the sanitary napkin industry really took off. The history of the tampon, like all of period history, is shrouded in a lot of mystery. The tampon as we know it wasn't invented until the 1930s, but there were tampon-like things around long before that. There's evidence to suggest that women in ancient Rome made tampons out of wool, whoo, itchy, and that Egyptian ladies might have used ones made of papyrus. People have used whatever they had in their parts of the world. Indonesian women have used vegetable fibers while some in Africa have used rolls of grass. A book about tampons from 1981 says that adventurous Hawaiian women have traditionally used the furry part of a native fern to soak up their business. In ancient Japan, another says they used paper secured in place with bandages, which absorbed liquids so fast they had to be changed 10 to 12 times a day. The word tampon comes from the medieval French word tampion, or plug a variant of the Old French tapon, or piece of cloth to stop a hole. In 1860, author R.G. Maine defined a tampon as a less inelegant term for the plug, whether made up of portions of rag, sponge, or a silk handkerchief, where plugging the vagina is had recourse to in cases of hemorrhage. But most tampons were used not for managing one's menstrual flow, it seems, but for getting medicine into the cervical region and for contraception. In 1880, U.S. gynecologist Paul Mund described eight different uses for a vaginal tampon, retaining the shape of the cervix, say, or helping with a prolapsed uterus. Only one of those eight was for the absorption of fluids. Menstruation wasn't mentioned in his work at all. 
In the 1870s, ads started appearing for Britain's Dr. Aveling's vaginal tampon tube, a complex contraption that involved an applicator made of glass and a glycerin-soaked tampon made of cotton and wood. Go gently there, time traveler. The British Medical Journal wasn't clear on who was meant to use this device, women at home or their doctors. Into the early 20th century, nurses were using tampons, defined as a plug of antiseptic wool wrapped in gauze with a string to help with removal, for clinical purposes. They were meant to break open the little capsules of antiseptic liquid that came with them before ramming them home. They were most often used to treat wounds and infections, and usually couldn't be found outside a hospital. And then came World War I. The same innovations that fueled the commercial pad industry also inspired a rethink of tampons. There's a wonderful myth about the guy who almost invented the tampon in the 1920s. A Kimberly Clark employee named John Williamson poked some holes in a condom, stuffed it with the materials used to make pads, and went to his dad, a Kimberly Clark medical consultant, to pitch it as an insert for menstruation. Dad, horrified, told his son, Never would I put any such strange article inside a woman. It's Colorado physician Earl Haas who gets the credit for the first menstrual tampon, patented in 1931. One version of the origin story goes that it's a female friend who inspired him, after she told him she preferred to insert a sponge into her cervical palace rather than use a pad. I like to imagine them having this chat in the middle of a fancy dinner party, but who knows. The conversation made him think of his wife, who was a ballerina, who struggled to dance wearing a bulky pad. A lot of women in the 19th and early 20th century didn't bother going to their mostly male doctors about anything period-related, even menstrual pain, because they knew what he'd say, that they were probably her fault. In 1850s America, one doctor attributed period complaints to prurient incitement of passion-stirring pictures, statues, music, novels, and theaters. Another blamed a premature menstrual flow on a woman's having gone into the city and eaten too many exciting foods. Maybe you shouldn't have had so much pasta, lady. After all, as a 1920s Kotex booklet called Preparing for Womanhood says, menstruation causes less muscular strength, less steadiness, and even less mental efficiency. Thousands of years beyond Pliny and Hippocrates, all that stuff about how periods make people weak and potentially unsound of mind was still being passed around. Mr. Haas knew he needed to combat these beliefs by coming up with a method by which someone could insert the tampon without risking any such calamity. He took his inspiration from the telescope, creating something that a woman could insert without ever touching her sensitive region. It's interesting to me that we think a man could have invented the tampon. Really, all he ever did was find a way to profit from it. Later, a lady named Gertrude Tendrick bought his patent for $32,000. She expanded production from sewing tampons at home to creating the first commercial tampon brand, Tampax. The name was a mashup of the word tampon and vaginal packs, the phrase most often used to describe feminine hygiene helpers at the time. Pads remained the most popular option, but by the mid-1940s, tampon use had expanded fourfold from where it started. Around that time, a German gynecologist named Judith Esser Mittag developed a digital, aka applied with just a finger, tampon that would come to be called the OB tampon. In the 1970s, some feminists started to question why they should hide or stem the flow of their periods at all. But this is also the era that saw a shift in the tampons on offer. In 1975, Procter & Gamble tested its first feminine hygiene product, a tampon called Rely. Shaped like a tea bag and made to expand both widthwise and lengthwise, it contained a whole host of chemicals, one with carboxymethylcellulose, or CMC. Chips of the stuff made the tampon hyper-absorbent. It was said that some could wear it for an entire period without taking it out. Japan banned its import because of its ingredients, but because of a loophole in the U.S. legislation, they weren't subject to any rigorous tests and made it to market. 
At that time, tampon manufacturers didn't need to list any of their tampons' ingredients on the box, and in many countries, they still don't. In 1978, the Berkeley Women's Health Collective complained about Rely. In a pamphlet, they blamed manufacturers for ignoring the risks of their ingredients. And yet Rely remained popular. By 1980, some researchers say nearly a quarter of tampon users were buying it. Then, between October of 1979 and May of 1980, 55 cases of toxic shock syndrome were reported to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Seven of those women died. A link between tampon use and TSS was suspected, then proven. It turns out that leaving a chemically starched piece of compacted cotton in your cervical palace for several days makes toxic shock much more likely. By 1980, a total of 812 menstruation-related cases were reported, 38 of them fatal. All the tampon companies fielded lawsuits, and Rely was pulled from shelves. Though some are still nervous about tampons, they remain a popular option today. One study from 2015 found that the average American woman is estimated to use more than 12,000 tampons in her lifetime. And more patents are being filed all the time. In the past five years, there's been one for a tampon with a saturation indicator, and even a vibrating tampon. I'm going to give that one some serious side-eye, but you know what? You do you. Pads and tampons are one use only, so not that environmentally friendly, and they can get pretty expensive. Many countries have taxed tampons as luxury items. Like my adopted country of Australia, which until fairly recently added 10% goods and services taxes on feminine hygiene products because they weren't deemed essential. One Mr. Waldridge had this to say about the move. As a bloke, I'd like shaving cream exempt, but I'm not expecting it to be. Spoken like someone who's never bled through his jeans at work. Even the more sustainable alternatives, like reusable underwear and cups, require you to shell out some money up front. There are many situations where such supplies are hard to find or too expensive. Hence the rise in period poverty, which is defined as a situation where someone's unable to access period products. This situation can have serious consequences, miss school or work, the possibility of physical harm or mental distress. Plus, we live in a world where many are embarrassed to go without or shamed for doing so. Perhaps that has something to do with the rise in drugs that let you skip your period altogether. One recent study found that in our era, some 59% of the American women surveyed said they'd rather not menstruate every month. Of these, a third said they were interested in not menstruating at all. There are plenty of reasons for this preference. It's messy, supplies are expensive, menstrual symptoms are disruptive, and for some, the experience is upsetting for a whole host of reasons. But there have always been people asking a revolutionary question. Why should we go to all this trouble to stop or even hide our flow at all? Take Kiran Gandhi. In 2015, she woke up to run the London Marathon and discovered she was on the first day of her period. She had a choice, run in an uncomfortable chafing pad or a potentially painful tampon, or just let it flow. She decided to prioritize her own comfort and bleed freely. A courageous and, as she wrote later, pretty freeing act. There's a lot more to say on this topic, of course, and it's one the Explorers will keep on coming back to. Given the misunderstandings and anxieties that our silence on menstruation has spawned, I think we should all talk about it more than we do. That's why I'm here, proudly sharing historical period facts. I hope you'll go forth into the world and do the same. This episode is brought to you by my wonderful patrons. Their support is a big part of what's kept the Explores on the air, and I'm so incredibly grateful. Since I wrapped up Season 2, I've had a lot of patrons hop on board, and I'm going to thank some of them now. My newest Pirate Queens and Lady Presidents. Joanna. Jen. Gianna. Taylor. Another Jen. Kim. Emily. Marcus. Jenna. Christina. Amy, Lauren, Elizabeth, A. Targ, Marbles Garbanzo, Doug, Paula, Michelle, Brenda, Shannon, Asha, 
Danielle, Mackenzie, Claire, Stephanie, Maddie, Brandy, Natalie, Nadia, Ashley, Tiffany, Christina, Rachel, Yasemin, Jennifer M., and Melissa. I also want to thank my boss ladies, Bronwyn, Elizabeth M., Grace, Hillary and Brian, Jessica, Sophie and Julian, Melissa K., Michelle, Nuria, Rebecca, and Tanya, and my adventuresses, Alexis, Carlos, Helena, Iris, Jessica R., Amber, Kelly, Lizzie E., Phil, Samantha M., and Stephanie C., my warrior queens, Avery and Lori, and my three amazing lady pharaohs who are all named Courtney. Love you, Courtneys. For just a few dollars a month, my patrons get exclusive access to sneak peeks, early releases, interviews, Q&As, polls, giveaways, and exclusive bonus episodes that you won't find anywhere else. So if you're interested, just go to my website and click on Become a Patron. To find show notes for this episode, including an episode transcript, my resources, further reading, and some really funny menstruation-related videos, just go to my website, theexplorespodcast.com. You can also find me on Instagram, that's my main social media game, at The Explorers Podcast, on Twitter, at The Explorers Pod, or on Facebook. Thanks, as always, to Mr. Explorers for my theme music and logo. And thanks to the following for their vocal stylings. My brother, John Armstrong, Paul Gablonski, a.k.a. Mr. Explores, and Dan Johnson. Mm-hmm.